Dr. Michael Bryan has been here, reminded me this is his third time. Third time. And we yeah. so much appreciate his being <laughs> involved with us. Um, he's modest, but he hit one, he's professor of history and legal studies at Bryan University. It was named after him, right? It was, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had an in with the that's hiring committee. That's a story in itself, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, there, okay, my fourth visit. When I come back, I'll talk about that. <laughs> he specializes in the impact of the Holocaust on the law, human rights, German criminal law, and international human humanitarian law, which he'll be, I think, talking about. Um, he has a doctorate in modern European history from Ohio State University and a Juris Doctorate from Creighton University. Um, in addition to teaching at a number of universities before he came to Bryant, he was also served as a judge advocate for the U.S. Air Force. That must have been interesting. It was. And he's the author of a number of books and articles. One, uh, World's History of War Crimes, another, Nazi Crimes and Their Punishment. And all that will be relevant, I think, to what he's going to be talking about. So, I could say a lot more about him, but yeah. lots of Brian. Thank you. Thank you. It is, uh, it's such a pleasure to be back with... Uh, with Bristol Community College, as, as Ron, Ron said, this is my, my third time around. And I, I feel at this point like I'm among friends uh -huh. coming back. It, it's, it, there's not that distance that you often have. I do uh, quite a few presentations during the year. It's usually much more formal. Uh, it's a friendly atmosphere, and I'm really glad to be back with you today. I have a prepared text that I'm actually going to read for a while. Uh, because this is a rather complex topic. And uh, I'm going to read from the text, and then after a, t after a time, I will break and have a chance then to do some question and answers with you. I'm sure we'll have a, a spirited discussion. Um, everybody has an opinion on this, this matter, right? And uh, as you'll see from my talk, I, I spent a good deal of time even wrestling with my own thinking about whether genocide is, is taking place in, in uh, Ukraine and how we can tell whether it's the action is genocidal or not. And if it is, what do we do with that? Right? Well, how, what does that leave us at the end of the day? Okay. And I'll try to use the microphone. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Almost from the beginning of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, news reports on Russia's advance have been filled with allegations of war crimes. Missile attacks on apartment buildings, hospitals, stores, churches, schools, in cultural sites, the use of cluster bombs, the apparent murders of civilians, mass rapes, and the invasion of Ukraine itself have provoked calls for criminal accountability. Responding to international outrage, the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, began an investigation of alle alleged war crimes shortly after the invasion. He has personally visited Poland and Ukraine, searching for evidence of both Russian and Ukrainian abuses. In July 2022, news sources reported that the ICC, the International Criminal Court, was preparing its first case against an accused Russian war criminal. The trial could start in as early as late 2022 or early 2023. Other bodies have conducted probes of alleged atrocities, including an investigation by the organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE is its acronym. In March, OSCE investigators issued a report summarizing their findings in which they affirmed, quote, clear patterns, unquote, of war crimes by Russian troops. The report also said Ukrainian soldiers had committed war crimes, particularly against Russian POWs, but added that, quote, violations by the Russian Federation are by, by far larger in nature and scale, unquote. The March OSCE report was followed by a second issued in July 2022, confirming that Russian forces had committed crimes against humanity in Ukraine. A focus of the July report was the discovery of torture chambers at a summer camp in the Ukrainian city of Bukha. Reports of 300 civilian executions by Russian troops had flowed into the UN Human Rights Office by late April. At the same time, well-sourced accusations surfaced of sexual violence, kidnappings, and deportations committed by Russian troops. Ukraine's prosecutor, prosecutor General Irena Venediktova estimated in April that the Russians had already committed in excess 
of 7,600 war crimes. By the end of May, that number had allegedly grown to 15,000. In late August, Ukrainian information sources reported that Russian troops had committed more than 29,000 war crimes and crimes of aggression. By contrast, War Crimes Watch Ukraine, a collaboration of the news program Frontline and the Associated Press, has recently cited a far smaller figure of 425 documented incidents involving potential war crimes. The fog of war may explain the wide variance in the estimated numbers. As we reflect on the prospects for holding the perpetrators of these crimes accountable, it must be conceded at the outset that Vladimir Putin's prosecution for war crimes appears highly unlikely. Rarely in history have the heads of powerful states been prosecuted for international crimes. Putin's position at the center of a nuclear state would seem to be unassailable. We are well advised, however, to recall that human beings have always imposed limitations on how and when war may be waged. We might also remember that the 20th and now 21st centuries have been distinguished by their insistence that heads of state and their accomplices should face retribution for their wartime violations. I would like to consider how human beings have arrived at this breakthrough in international justice before turning to the prospects for putting Russian war crimes at all levels of government on trial. You know, forgive me, I'm going to step into a time machine at this point and go back a little bit to try to provide a context for our discussion of what might be done with, with Russian perpetrators in Ukraine. And I'd like to start with the high Middle Ages, a period of time in Western Europe when kings issued national laws that imposed restrictions on war making. The first was King John's Constitutions of 1214, which broadened the class of protected persons in wartime to include not only the church, but peasants and their property. A still more important law may have been King Richard II's ordinances of 1385, banning robbery, plunder, and killing, or capturing unarmed women and clergymen during battle. The ordinance of Charles VII of France in 1439 and the Scottish Articles and Ordinances of, ordinances of War of 1643 sustained these protections of civilian populations against murder, rape, imprisonment, ransoming, and plunder. These laws were national in origin and scope. They did not conceive of the law of war as a body of international legal principles controlling how warfare would be properly waged. The restraints on warfare contained in these laws ran in counterpoint to the growing power of European monarchs, whose authority had become almost absolute by the mid-17th century. For the next several hundred years, the initiation of war and the manner of its conduct would be determined solely by the sovereign. Likewise, the rise of the nation state as the dominant unit in international relations ensured that accountability for wartime atrocities would be determined by the sovereign authority based on domestic law. This would remain the case until the 19th century when, for the first time, the world's nations signed international conventions explicitly aiming to reduce the suffering of warfare. Nearly all of the leading treaties from the mid-19th century through the first half of the 20th centuries, the first Geneva Convention of 1864, the creation of the Red Cross, the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, the Geneva Conventions of 1929 and 1949, and the anti-chemical weaponry conventions of the 1920s. All of these, these instances, all of these instruments were responses to catastrophic wars. During the era of the French Revolution, the transition from dynastic wars fought between professional armies to the nation at arms that assembled its armies from the entire adult population marked an important step toward larger and more violent warfare. Refinements in technology, particularly in ballistics, synergized with the nation at arms model to raise warfare to unprecedented heights of deadliness. The conventions written between the 1850s and World War I might be most accurately seen as efforts to rein in the appalling bloodshed and suffering that modern warfare now 
produced. Well into the 20th century, little consensus existed about what precisely war crimes were or how they should be treated. The two world wars of the first half of the 20th century were milestones along the road toward defining war crimes and making perpetrators liable for them under international law. As measured by outcomes, however, World Wars I and II could not be more different. In both conflicts, a major offender against the law of war was Germany. The actions of the German military during the Great War, World War I, were so extreme that Allied nations clamored for criminal punishment. German excesses included the invasion and occupation of neutral Belgium, the killing of thousands of Belgian civilians, and destruction of cultural landmarks, especially in the Belgian city of Leuven, and the deployment of poisonous gas, among many others. Accordingly, provisos were inserted in the Treaty of Versailles to try the Kaiser, to put Kaiser Wilhelm on trial, not for war crimes, this is a term that was not used at this time, but for, to quote the language of the provision, a supreme offense against international morality, unquote. The plan to try the Kaiser collapsed when he fled to the Netherlands, which refused extradition. Fearful that Allied prosecution of German soldiers would weaken the newly founded Weimar Republic, the Allies left it to the German Reich Supreme Court in Leipzig to try them with predictable results. Few, if any, of the offenders were punished. World War II was quite different. The violence of modern warfare and the willingness of national leaders to unleash it in campaigns of mass murder and genocide convinced the victors by 1945 that a judicial reckoning was necessary. The Nuremberg International Tribunal and its sister court in Asia, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, were the first to try accused war criminals on the principle of individual responsibility for violating international law. Furthermore, both tribunals declared that political and military leaders involved in planning or ordering war crimes were criminally responsible under international law. Other international conventions followed, the Genocide Convention of 1848 and the Geneva Conventions of 1949 being among the most significant. The legal basis of the Nuremberg Tribunal was the London Charter, a document produced in August 1945 by the representatives of the United States, Great Britain, France, and the USSR. The Charter's Article 6 set forth the charges that would be prosecuted at Nuremberg and later at the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. These were crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, conspiracy, and membership in a criminal organization. While crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, conspiracy, and membership in a criminal organization were novel charges in international law at that time, the war crimes charge recited widely accepted elements of the traditional law of war. These had to do with the use of slave labor, murders and ill treatment of prisoners of war, plunder, and the gratuitous destruction of civilian buildings, all banned by the Geneva and Hague Conventions. What was new about the war crimes charge was the Allies' willingness to declare these acts criminally punishable under international law. For the first time in history, the former leaders of two of the world's most powerful states, Nazi Germany, and Imperial Japan were prosecuted for their wartime actions. After the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals adjourned, no ad hoc international criminal tribunal was formed until the 1990s. At this time, the familiar cycle of catastrophic wars producing legal institutions was again played out. The Balkan Wars had begotten the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY is the acronym, by 1993, while the Rwandan genocide produced a comparable body in 1994, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, or ICTR. 
Both of these courts have produced seminal judgments in international criminal law. In 1998, the United Nations created, for the first time in history, a permanent, a permanent international criminal court with jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against peace, genocide, and crimes against humanity. This is, of course, the International Criminal Court. Its charter, the Rome Statute, was explicitly modeled on the London Charter that created the Nuremberg Tribunal in 1945. Therein, we encounter the familiar charges of crimes against peace, in Article 5, war crimes in Article 8, crimes against humanity in Article 7, as well as genocide set forth in Article 6. The ICC's genocide provision is explicitly modeled on the UN Genocide Convention of 1948. Since Nuremberg, war crimes have become generally recognized as criminal offenses under international law. Their criminality may today appear to us to be self-evident and uncontroversial. But this was not always the case. Neither the Hague nor Geneva Conventions prior to 1949 contained penal provisions. This is the watershed significance of the World War II jurisprudence. Because for the first time, courts said that wartime atrocities incurred international criminal liability. The Geneva Conventions of 1949 condemned violations of the law of war as, quote, grave breaches, grave breaches, unquote, which included inhumane acts like willfully, willful killing and torture. Today, grave breaches are accepted as war crimes prosecutable under international law. The preamble to the Rome Statute describes as one of the ICC's aims the punishment of, quote, shocking, unquote, crimes, shocking crimes that threaten global peace. Such language can only bring to painful mind the war raging today in Ukraine. Can or will Russian atrocities be punished under international criminal law? Political leaders across the world, among them our president, Joe Biden, are demanding that Russia's actions be investigated and, where supported, criminally punished. The obstacles to prosecution are formidable. Legal analysts bemoan Russia's catbird seat on the Security Council from which it can veto any attempt to create a Nuremberg-style ad hoc court to prosecute Russian crimes in, in Ukraine. Because neither Russia nor Ukraine were signatories to the International Criminal Court, the Rome Statute does not allow prosecution of crimes against peace for the invasion of Ukraine. Crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide, on the other hand, might yet be prosecuted there. Moreover, because these acts confer universal jurisdiction, any signatory to the Geneva Conventions or the, the Genocide Convention is legally authorized to prosecute suspected Russian war criminals in their domestic courts. This has already happened to a Russian tank commander charged with and convicted of a war crime by a Ukrainian domestic court in May of 2022. If Vladimir Putin has committed the crime of aggression, which according to the Nuremberg uh, trials is a crime against peace, where could Putin be tried and what is the likelihood of his prosecution? The venues for a trial of Putin for aggression are multiple. The International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, but because neither Russia nor Ukraine are signatories, to the Rome Statute that created the court, the ICC would have no jurisdiction over the invasion. While the Security Council might, in theory, request an investigation by the ICC into aggression, Russia could veto any such resolution as a permanent member of the Security Council. Might Putin be tried in an ad hoc court like Nuremberg, the ICTY, or the ICTR? And the answer, is a theoretical yes. But again, closer inspection reveals the daunting problems of trying Putin for the crime of aggression in a modern-day Nuremberg. 
Efforts to create such a court could only arise from the United Nations, where both Russia and China could veto them. And I would note in passing that this is an area of contestation today. There are some legal scholars like Philippe Sands who think that the, the world community might be able to create an ad hoc tribunal like the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal by bypassing the Security Council and just doing it as, a, as, a, as an act of state. But we can maybe talk about that during the question and answer. What about prosecuting Putin in a domestic court under the principle of universal jurisdiction? And again, this is a real possibility. Numerous European courts, I'm sorry, European countries, are investigating Russian war crimes in Ukraine. In theory, their courts, as well as the court system of Ukraine, might prosecute Putin. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and other Russian officials for aggression if they were able to obtain personal jurisdiction over them. However, the international principle of sovereign immunity could and probably would shield Putin from prosecution in a national domestic court. Sovereign immunity, however, would not prevent domestic courts from prosecuting lower-ranking members of the government involved in supporting the illegal invasion. Ukraine is currently pursuing a case of aggression against Russia at the International Court of Justice. In mid-March, the ICJ ordered Russia to desist from further military action in Ukraine, a demand that Russia has simply ignored. A similar verdict was issued by the European Court of Human Rights, demanding an end to attacks on civilian targets and the creation of humanitarian corridors. Russia ignored this judgment too. The bottom line is that neither of these courts would be adequate to prosecute Russian leaders for aggression. The European Court of Human Rights might order Russia to pay reparations for its invasion of Ukraine, but Russia would assuredly refuse. The only retaliation that the European Court of Human Rights could pursue is excluding Russia from the Council of Europe a body that Russia already left in March of 2022. Prospects for trying Putin for aggression look quite improbable. This, of course, could change if Russia loses the war and or Putin is ousted from power and then extradited to a court willing to try him. This has happened before, right? It happened in Sudan with al-Bashir. So it conceivably could happen in Russia. But absent such an event, the best bet for prosecuting Putin for aggression would be creation of an ad hoc tribunal, which could occur only if Russia's veto power could somehow be avoided. The brightest prospects for successful prosecution of Russian uh, crimes in Ukraine relate to war crimes rather than the crime of aggression. Prosecuting Russian military and political figures for war crimes might be pursued at the International Criminal Court, in domestic courts, or at an ad hoc tribunal. Before we consider the various forums, we should determine first whether Russia has committed war crimes in Ukraine. This would certainly appear to be the case. The three principles of criminal liability in wartime are, number one, the doctrine of military necessity, which directs that only military targets can be attacked. Number two, the doctrine of proportionality, requiring that no more force than necessary be used to achieve a military objective. And number three, the principle of humanity, the imperative of seeking to minimize suffering and the destruction of civilian life and property. The indiscriminate destruction of civilian homes, firing on civilians as they, they uh, flee through prearranged humanitarian corridors, targeting hospitals, blocking access to humanitarian aid, in executing non-combatants all violate one or more of these principles. To prove these charges, however, prosecutors would have to demonstrate that the actions were intentional. Further, they would have to refute possible defenses raised by Russian defendants that the civilians were, in fact, not civilians, but had become combatants, mobilized in a levy en masse by the Ukrainian government. Such a defense, if accepted by a court, would render attacks on civilians who become combatants potentially legal under international law. 
as would the bombing of civilian targets used to attack Russian forces. You can see how complicated this could be. Right? To prove war crimes against top figures like Putin, a prosecutor would have to show that they either ordered the illegal action themselves or failed to prevent or suppress the crimes committed by their subordinates. Clearly, this would be easier to prove against a military commander in the field than against a head of state far removed from the crime scene, like Putin sitting in his office in Moscow. It's not that it's impossible. It's just much more difficult. You've got to think like a lawyer here. How can you prove your case? Right? The ICC would be uh, the most favorable venue for adjudicating war crimes committed in Ukraine. Because Ukraine accepted ICC, the ICC's jurisdiction over crimes committed on its territory since November 2013, the court would have jurisdiction over war crimes that it lacks over crimes against peace. Similarly, domestic courts might exercise jurisdiction over war crimes committed by military members in the field and lower echelons of the Russian government. But again, sovereign immunity might block Putin's prosecution for such offenses. Establishing an ad hoc Nuremberg-style tribunal for Russian war crimes would also be advantageous, yet the prospects for it seem quite unlikely. Even if a veto from the Security Council could be averted, Russia would likely refuse to deliver up its political and military leadership for prosecution. Only the lowest level perpetrators at the bottom of the chain of command would then be prosecuted. The same analysis that we've applied to war crimes and the crime of aggression would also be relevant to prosecuting Russian perpetrators for genocide in Ukraine. With respect to genocide, however, the world community may encounter obstacles even more formidable than those raised by war crimes. And so I'm going to talk for a few minutes. I'll close with some discussion of these problems and the prospects for trying Russian perpetrators for genocide. And then we can talk a little bit amongst ourselves in the Q&A. It seems quite likely that the Russians have committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression in Ukraine. I can thank a few international legal analysts who would dispute this. Genocide is an entirely different matter, however. Genocide is not just large-scale killing of civilians. This is a really important point that I think the public doesn't always appreciate. Right? Genocide is more than this. It's not just large-scale killing of civilians. The 1948 Genocide Convention, which is reproduced today in the ICC's Rome Statute, requires a, quote, specific intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, unquote. It's the, the famous definition, right? A specific intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. It then goes on to list five actions that would qualify as genocide if accompanied by the intent to eliminate the group. And these are, number one, killing members of the group. Number two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Number three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. Number four, imposing measures to prevent births within the group. Or number five, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So to prove a case of genocide against the Russians, a prosecutor would have to show that the perpetrators killed Ukrainian civilians with the intention of wiping out the Ukrainians as a people. It's a critical factor here, right? Being able to show just killing of civilians is not enough. You could prosecute them for war crimes or crimes against humanity for doing such things. Genocide is different. You have to have evidence of that specific intent to eliminate the Ukrainian nation. You have to prove, in other words, that the killings were intended to eradicate Ukraine as a national group. <coughs> it's, significant <coughs> excuse me. it's significant that political leaders <coughs> and analysts today can't agree 
cannot agree on whether Russian actions in Ukraine satisfy the legal definition of genocide. In April, President Biden accused Russia of genocide in Ukraine, yet many experts have not joined the American president's assessment. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum has not determined that Russia's actions meet the definition of genocide, although it has condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the war crimes associated with it. So my question now is, is there evidence of genocide in Ukraine? In fact, there is some evidence, some evidence of a specific intent of the Russian leadership to commit genocide. How many of you remember Putin's justification for invading Russia, I mean, invading, Russia invading Ukraine? How many of you remember his justification? So if you go back and listen to it or listen to the translation of it, his statement reeks of a genocidal intention. He specifically talks about destroying the Ukrainian nation. Furthermore, in an, er an early editorial published by state-owned media, there was a demand that large numbers of Ukrainians be killed. Why? Does anybody recall? This actually made the news at the time, back in April. Supposedly because they were Nazis. That was the charge. Does anybody recall this? That was the position of the not only of, of Putin, but also of the, uh, the Russian government and, and state-owned media in Russia. Yeah, the editorialists wrote that, and I'll just quote here, uh, denazification is inevitably also de-Ukrainization. I mean, that's, that's pretty incriminating isn't it? As, a, as a genocidal intent. I mean, that seems to fall squarely within the definition of a specific intent to destroy a national group, right? If accompanied then by action to do so. Now, shortly after this editorial was published, a high-ranking deputy to Putin, Dmitry Medvedev, made the following statement. I will quote from his statement. It should not be surprising that Ukraine, which has been transformed mentally into the Third Reich, will suffer the same fate. So what was the fate of the Third Reich by 1945? It was wiped off the face of the earth. So Medvedev is already saying in these words that Ukraine should be wiped off the face of the earth as a national entity. I mean, it sounds really incriminating. To treat Medvedev's warning that the Ukrainian nation would be wiped out like the Third Reich was, or the Russian editorialists demand that Ukrainians be killed as proof of an intent to commit genocide, these statements would have to be linked with Russian troops attacks on innocent civilians. That is, the destruction of civilian life by the Russian military must be connected to the Russian government's aim to exterminate Ukraine as a nation. Now, some observers think that the words of Putin and the Russian media and Dmitry Medvedev all satisfy the intent requirement of the Genocide Convention. Other analysts, Disagree. While nearly everyone thinks Russia has committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and aggression, that much is, is a consensus, so far as I can tell, some experts are not convinced that Russian violence in Ukraine rises to the level of genocide. Their point is that mass murder, however abhorrent, however criminal, is not necessarily genocide. Even the alarming language of Medvedev and the Russian media may not be evidence of a genocidal intent if, if on-the-ground actions by Russian troops, such as the massacres of civilians in the Ukrainian town of Buka, and there was a, a new one too just a few days, uh, Itzium, I think is the name of the town. They discovered hundreds of mass graves in the town of Itzium. But if you cannot somehow trace these massacres, to the words and the policies of the government, then you will not be able to prove genocide. Right? That, that's the critical proof that has to be established. So such indeterminacy besets contemporary discussions of genocide in the 20th century. Scholars cannot even today agree on how many genocides occurred 
in the 20th century. Do you know that? They can't even agree among themselves. Some of them say only three. Others say 20. Some say more. These, these are estimates by the people who study this for a living, and they can't even, cannot even agree with themselves, with each other. Quite often, the lack of consensus comes down to the lack of firm proof bearing on why certain mass killings were carried out. Proving mass murder, even mass murder inspired by racial, national, or ethnic hatred, may not be sufficient to prove a specific intent to eliminate such groups. I'd be curious whether anyone wants to talk about this during the Q&A. Right? Right? So you, you can commit a crime because you hate Ukraine. You, you can kill a Ukrainian or even 10 Ukrainians because you don't like Ukrainians. But if your intention is not to eliminate in whole or in part the Ukrainian people as a nation, then it's not genocide. That's, that's the point here. The situation in Ukraine is tougher still because it's an ongoing conflict. Right? The war is still going on, and Lord knows how long it's going to go on for. We don't know. Thorough investigations cannot, in many cases, be carried out, at least not yet. When they are, we must also be vigilant to the Ukrainians' perfectly understandable incentives to portray Russian actions in the worst possible light. My point is not, and please don't misunderstand me here, my point is not that genocide has not been committed, nor that evidence of a specific intent will never be found. My point, rather, is that proving genocide is much harder than people realize. It's much more challenging than proving war crimes or the crime of aggression. Connecting the words of the perpetrators with specific instances of mass killing is one way to substantiate a charge of genocide. Another is documenting the pattern of violence committed by Russian forces in Ukraine to determine whether this pattern reveals a genocidal intention to destroy the Ukrainian nation. Here, too, we run into the problem of incomplete data. Clearly, atrocities have been committed. But it's not clear, at least not yet, that the pattern of atrocities would support a finding of genocide. As some analysts have said, we don't know at this stage anything about the kinds of orders that were issued or their relationship to the mass killings. Therefore, we can't formulate right now a convincing explanation of whether the massacres had a systematic character. This fact may explain why neither Genocide Watch nor the Early Warning Project of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum have issued a genocide risk alert for Ukraine. I would note in passing as I just checked yesterday, that Genocide Watch has issued a warning of genocide preparation, what they call genocide preparation, targeting Ukrainian loyalists in the Donbass region where Donbass separatists have been harassing them. The warning does not extend to Russian actions in other parts of the country. All of this naturally can change quite abruptly if new evidence emerges. That evidence might help us to draw linkages between individual massacres of Ukrainian civilians and the specific intent to commit genocide required by international law. At the very least, it would seem beyond dispute that Russia has committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression, all grave crimes under international law. Whether it has also committed genocide remains to be seen. Right now, I don't think this question can be answered. Ultimately, a judicial confrontation with Russian crimes that matches the mood of the times requires a trial that deals with what were called at Nuremberg the major war criminals. Well, who are these? Well, obviously, Vladimir Putin, Sergei Lavrov, and the upper levels of the Russian government. Unless Putin is overthrown, none of this seems likely. Nonetheless, the world community might best do what it has been doing the past several months, namely gathering evidence of Russian crimes and holding it in reserve for the day should that day arrive when the wheel of fortune turns and Putin and his accomplices become vulnerable to international justice. Thank you for your attention today, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions from you all. Thank you. It's a little bit longer than I had planned, but hopefully we'll have time for questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, fascinating uh, summary. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question on the last point we were talking about the genocide uh, and the definition.
position you're on. Do you think, and I, I think, um, that one of the challenges is that Ukraine is a homogeneous country in terms of, you know, generally speaking, in terms of religion, ethnicity, etc. So when we look at Yugoslavia or what happened in Africa, right there, you know, there was a diversity, so the population was much easier to identify the population, the, you know, in, in Serbian versus Croats, etc., and the same in, in Rwanda. In Ukraine, I think the only way it could elevate um, with the evidence to the level that they need mm -hmm. would be if they went in and basically killed every Ukrainian they see, right? Because if you're targeting the Ukrainian, Ukraine, but, but, but killing is only one facet of genocide, right? The, but or do something, whether you're going to take them and you know, ship them to Siberia or whatever, right? I mean, or, put them in camps or right. do something with them. So in that bus you mentioned, yeah. they are doing that because they can distinguish. They have, they have diversity. Right. So they have Ukrainians who are supporting um, the anti-Putin versus not, and they right. don't have that. I, I guess what I'm trying to say, they don't have it in the rest of Ukraine. So unless they go out to the entire population, and how do you do that? I, I think, think the idea would be to, to, uh, to take over all of Ukraine and to essentially eliminate it as a nation. I mean, I, I, and you can, so do, you can do that short of killing people. You, you, can, you can simply take them over and impose Russian hegemony on the, on the Ukrainian population. Would that be considered Yes. Yeah, I mean, if, 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 if they are seeking to destroy in whole or in part the Ukrainian people as a nation, that, that can be done biologically, of course, but that's not the only way. I mean, Lemkin is very clear about this in his definition of genocide. Right? Killing people is just one way, an extreme way, but there are other methods too, like transporting children, taking the children and raising them as, as Russians with, with, with Russian culture rather than Ukrainian culture as their touchstone, right? I mean, there are different ways in which you can get rid of a nation. Uh, I mean, the Ukrainians would contend you would exist biologically, but they would, their culture, their, their nationhood, their status, their, their language, their customs, their independence as a country, that would be eliminated. And I think that would satisfy the, the definition of genocide under the convention. Yeah, yeah. We've done that with the, the areas Removing Ukraine, Ukrainian independence, Ukrainian culture, and all of that um, from anything that the children are learning now in those occupied areas. Yeah, well, that that obviously would be ev evidence that would weigh in favor of a finding that genocide has taken place. Yeah, I, I I tried to canvass among legal scholars who have addressed this question, and there's there's such a split. There's some people who do believe, based on the statements that have been made and some of the things that have been done on the ground being able to try to match those together, there does seem to be a case that could be made for genocide. Others are, uh, believe it's, it's too, too fragile. And that if you were to try, even today, just hypothetically, to try the case, it would collapse. Mm -hmm. That, um, that a, 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 a finder of fact, a finder of law, either a judge or a jury, who simply would not, would not find it to have, to have taken place. Yes, sir? I uh, understand that some of their historical their museums are a target of the Russians, too, to eliminate yeah, that's right. culture. Yeah. But I think time, as you said earlier, when, if this thing ever ends, and hopefully you know, Ukraine is a, victor, a victory yeah. for Ukraine, we'll have, we'll have time to look at all the data and we will find the culprits. Right. That's, that's really, really the key point. That's really the key point. My, my own belief, if I were to, you know, if I were a betting man, I, I think genocide is. Being, is, is being undertaken by, by the Russians. I believe their, their goal was, is to eliminate Ukraine as a nation. Now, the question is proving it at this point. I think that it's a pretty slender read to yeah. stake that case on now. I believe there is some evidence for it, whether it rises to that level of uh, indubio pro reo under international law, the, the beyond a reasonable doubt that we would say in this country. It's a, a different will matter. Emerge. The what, what? Eyewitnesses will emerge like they did to right. uh, the Nazi Germany. Sure. They will come out. They'll come forward. I think really the best policy at this point is to be patient. And uh, the Ukrainians are doing extremely well. I'm very concerned with what I'm seeing from Putin, though. He's already threatening, if you read the papers today or not, but he's, he's threatening to use nuclear weapons again. So whether that is just a bluff, uh, I don't know. But it's, uh, it's obviously horrible, horrible really bluff. concerning. Yeah, really concerning. Yes, ma'am. Regarding the excuse of uh, we're trying to Nazis, again, 
just as on a matter that there's no evidence, there's no symbolism in these schools and hospitals that have been attacked by Russia, uh, no Nazi flags, no Nazi symbols, no Nazi uniforms, right. does that not matter? I mean, it's, it doesn't matter because it's rubbish. And it's, it's, it's a pretext, a flimsy pretext to justify naked aggression. And I think it would be seen that way. I mean, there is a consensus now that the attack on Ukraine by the Russians was a crime of aggression. And the question then is how can you prosecute people for that? I tried to address that with respect to war crimes and uh, crimes against peace. It, c it could be done. Uh, probably not at the level of the ICC for the reasons I, I said. They're just, they don't have jurisdiction over the offense. But possibly through other alternative uh, fora. Yes, I saw another hand up. Oh. Doesn't that go back to, um, you know, Russia now is a successor of the Soviet Union, how the Soviet Union sold the World War One. I mean, sorry, World War II. I mean, they weren't, yes, it was Nazis, but it was Yes, it was the West, exactly. Yeah, that, yes, exactly. that's how he's trying to portray it. He's it's, trying to portray it as the West. And they, they a war never, against the West. And it was the, the, the great patriotic war. So they're seeing it as World War II, they saw it as a patriotic war. Um, <coughs> anyone that was against Russia was a Nazi. So they're kind of redoing this whole wheel. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the, the Soviet education um, that you know, and even when you look at even um, Zelensky, how Zelensky is framed things, who also was, you know, raised in Soviet Ukraine. Um, there's that, all of those former Eastern Bloc countries never had a, a revamp of their education until, until recently. So World War II was always seen as that great patriotic war. Sure. So that's kind of how Putin is still framing it as like the war with Ukraine or the invasion of Ukraine is an extension of that, you know, Great Patriotic War Part Two. Right. Um, so it's it's like when we try and look at it as well, why are they saying Nazis and fascists? To us, it's mind-boggling. But yeah, to you, that Eastern Bloc mentality, sure. it, it doesn't. It is an sense. effort to legitimate. Right. right. What yes. I think is naked aggression. Oh, absolutely. Right? It's just yeah. yeah. Just like a comment, do you think that the being a certification comment has something to do with the fact that there were so many Germans who, you know, moved to Ukraine territory, you know, beginning of the century? So there was this, whole, and then they went back, but there was that whole concept that there were so many Germans, uh, mm -hmm. people German, you sure. know, people of German descent living there. And German minorities there. Yeah. Minority there, um, who were who were moved back when out of twenties or you know even earlier. And they, they were sort of, they called Ukraine, but they were of German descent. And I know, I don't know if that has something to do with Yeah, not, not to mention the fact that Ukraine, of course, was implicated in the Holocaust. I mean, uh, because yeah. of what happened. I mean, I grew up in Poland, and I certainly yeah. have, have lived through that education where, you know, the Katyn, you know, massacre in Poland, I remember like today, history lesson, you know, Germans did it, and a friend of mine, you know, raised his hand in eighth grade and said, oh, my parents, you know, told me it was Russian, but, you know, he was yeah. kicked out of, you know, he, I mean, I don't remember, I think the teachers have just, we don't talk about it, we don't talk about it. Interestingly so, enough, the, yeah. the Russian government has confessed that it's, uh, it Oh, yeah, by now, but it was yeah. like in 80, you know, mid-80s, yeah. so it was yeah, still, decades ago. it was still, um, you know, so definitely our history was definitely slanted. Yeah, um, no doubt. So, but to your point earlier, uh, and I don't know how it really, connects to all of this, the brainwashing of the Russian population, and I don't think it's just as it relates to the Ukrainian conflict. Um, it's, I, I don't know how, how that goes into all of it. And I have no I idea. I, I don't, I've not seen any polling data. Does anybody in Russia buy this argument that they're trying to denazify you? I mean, I, 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 don't know. I, I, I would think war, not. The whole war and, you know, and, sure. you know, there is no war. The whole thing, that there is no war. Um, there's not much happening out there. Well, victors write history, revise history. That's my take on this. Russia had a different view of history. They wipe out the things that are not unacceptable. And I have to say, in some cases, we have as well. Our minorities, for example. So it's just to the victor, to the victor, those are spoilers. <laughs> 
Yeah, most historians recognize that. There are yes. there historians here today. I think most of us would recognize that. A lot of truth in it. I saw there was a hand here, then a hand hand here. But I'm not sure who was first. I saw the hand over here. No. Okay. We'll go to this gentleman. Yeah. I, I have a, a more general question. Um, is the USA part of the International Criminal Court? No. No. So we never. We never. I I, I thought never I never signed the Rome Statute. That being the case, do you have any thoughts as to why that is? Yeah, I mean, I, I have my own theories <laughs> as, to, yeah. as to why. I mean, I think probably a lot of people you know, here today probably have a sense of why the United States has been reluctant. It has everything to do with sovereignty and uh, concern that the United States would be hauled into the court and prosecuted I mean, for crimes committed in Iraq, crimes committed in Afghanistan. I mean, when you have the American president, uh, not the not the current one, but the previous one, you know, pardoning mass murderers as he as he did and as he has did, has done. I mean, if we were signatories to the court, then the ICC could indict those people and try to have them extradited to the Hague. So I, yeah, I think the United States is just really leery of having its own people be put on trial. But hypocritical, I think. Arguably, arguably, but uh, we have no problem with the idea of putting Putin on trial or the Russians, but we just don't want ourselves to be put on trial. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us a little bit more about Philippe Sands? About what? Philippe Sands' uh, idea of all of this. Yeah, he, uh, he's proposed that, and I don't even know how likely this is, quite frankly. His argument is this. You can tell me what you think, right? As intelligent people, and we hear what you think. He goes back to 1945 and says, look, there was no UN at that time, there was no Security Council, and it's an act of, um, really of the spoils of the victor. The Allies decided they were going to create this international military tribunal and put the Germans and the Japanese on trial for, for these offenses, war crimes, crimes against humanity, membership in criminal organizations, aggression, that was not created by the UN, right? Nuremberg was not a UN institution. So Sands's view is that, from what I can gather, again, I, I've not examined his, his, any writings in which he's tried to elaborate this concept in more detail, but from what I can tell, his, his point seems to be that we could create a similar, that is the world community, could create a similar court without involving the Security Council. That, that's really the rub, isn't it? That, that's the, the fly in the ointment. Because Russia sits on the Security Council, China does too, and China probably would vote against it. Russia assuredly would. So how can you bypass the Security Council? Well, maybe just the world community, uh, France, Great Britain, the United States, other powerful countries just dec declare that they're creating this court. And it becomes, uh, it comes into existence then, and then the struggle is to try to obtain jurisdiction over the, over the perpetrators. Because a court like this probably would really tackle the higher ranking people, just like Nuremberg did. It wasn't, you know, the Americans, the British, the French, they weren't interested all that much in the lower ranking people. Th those people were put on trial in military commission trials by the army, in trials that lasted two or three days. The IMT at Nuremberg lasted a year. Um, and focused on top ranking people. Had, had Hitler survived the war, had Himmler survived the war, then, or Goebbels, they would have been tried at Nuremberg. And they had them in custody already. Yeah, Goebbels, of course, committed suicide. Himmler was in custody, he committed, committed suicide with the cyanide pill in, in July of 1945. Um, yeah, Hitler, of course, committed suicide in April before the war came to an end. But there were plans to put them on trial. Right. But the Nuremberg. Others, they, were, they already had them in they custody did. while they were yes. planning the trial. So yes, yeah. And one of the problems here is that we don't have anybody in custody other than the lower ranking people in some cases. But, and unless Putin is defeated and then maybe overthrown and becomes vulnerable, as I suggested in, in my talk, it's, an, it's inconceivable that Russia would deliver him up for prosecution. Never say never, but uh, it's hard to imagine that. Any other comments or questions? Oh, goodness, it's afternoon. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very, very welcome. I'm glad to be here.